Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at William Sausage, the home of authentic country goodness and family-owned and operated since 1958, right here in Tennessee. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. On today's episode, Scott sits down with Jeray Holder, who is a writer on NBC's New Amsterdam. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South as we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of our home here in West Tennessee. Today's guest, Jeray Breon Holder, is a celebrated novelist, playwright, and screenwriter who hails from Memphis, but made his way to Yale, Broadway, Hollywood, and is now back in Memphis for a short time, where the Hattie Lou Theater is performing his play, Too Heavy for Your Pockets. Welcome, Jeray. Thanks for having me. I read a description of your writing as sharp yet funny and including wild visual metaphors and addressing the magic of everyday life in the South. I like that. Now that, you, <laughs> now that you've lived a lot of other places, it, what, it, what is special about everyday life in the South? What does the South mean to you? Um, yeah, it's true. I've lived, I've lived um, in Connecticut now, New York now, and Los Angeles and none of those cities have the relationship to nature that I feel that Atlanta and more specifically Memphis has. Mm-hmm. And it's um, it's the special kind of relationship w- with the Mississippi right there and so much of the culture and economy being um, like outdoor based, just like, you know, plantations or growing stuff for, for so long um, that it wasn't urbanized or industrialized in the same way that other places were. And there's just something really magical about mixing that with the music, with the people that is unlike anywhere else. And, and oftentimes people have such a misconception about it that I have a really good time blowing people's minds. <laughs> it was like, no, no, I'm from Memphis and here are some things about the place that I'm from and the picture in people's head is just so different than reality and then I think more special than reality. Yeah, I've, I've actually had people who've, who've come to visit here from like New York or Los Angeles and, they, and they're just, they want to go see something growing in a field. Mm-hmm. They've never actually seen things growing in the ground. Isn't so, that wild? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> or they'll say, what were all those things that, you know, what, what was that we were passing? You know, uh-huh. I'm like, yeah, well, those were soybeans, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's really fun. Um, so you've, you've, congratulations on all your success. You're back in town yeah. because you're having a play produced at the Hattie Lou Theater. Mm-hmm. First of all, the Hattie Lou Theater is an amazing place. It's amazing. Have you have you been there yet? Oh yeah, yeah, many times. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And uh, uh, my mom set up this um, reception for kind of opening weekend so that my family could come from Nashville and people came from various places. And it's amazing that it's a space that can have this play going on, they're hosting a reception in the back for us and across the hall is a Sweet 16. <laughs> and it's not only just this amazing theater space that that is really unlike any other, just, just like of a, a building that's dedicated to black theater, does not happen in the country, actually. It's just not a a commonplace thing. But in addition to that, it's a place that the community can use for its own purposes. And I just love it. I think it's an honor to be invited there. And it's nice to have um, the theater you know, there and everybody being exposed. Um, you grew up in Memphis. Uh-huh. Um, what was your first exposure to live performances? So the theater bug bit me really, really young. And I didn't know that it bitten me because it felt like the special thing that I just did this one time, I guess. <laughs> um, but um, but my most kind of definitive performance, I was eight years old, I think, eight or nine, and my folks took me to see a production of a play called Sang, Sister Sang, which was mostly on the Chitlin circuit, just going to these various <laughs> places, but it was at the Orpheum. Yeah. And it was about Josephine Baker, Mahalia Jackson, Bessie Smith, Dinah Washington, meeting in heaven. Mm-hmm. And it was basically a review show, kind of, for the most part. And I... I, it was seared into my memory of these kind of amazing performers on stage channeling real people from the past in this imaginative space. It just clicked with 
who I was and what I was interested in, even at such an early age. Wow. That moving on, I also, you know, my folks took me to stuff. So Lion King toured or um, Wicked toured or whatever. But that one experience of like going to the afterlife for a few, few minutes to sit with some African-American greats was something that feels like the peak of what theater can do. And I, I have to mention that you went to Snowden uh-huh, um, yes. Elementary in uh, mm-hmm. Memphis, which was where my kids went. So shout out to all the Snowden teachers mm-hmm. who impacted your life. Um, I'm sure that the big, were you on the Snowden stage at some point uh, was, for a I, Christmas so, musical? Or? <laughs> so my most visceral memories of Snowden are Miss, uh, Miss Hopwood's class. Mm-hmm. And that's where I had kind of my first crew of bad boyfriends. And so this is, so, so I, I remember Nick and Ross and Xiao, Xiao Young, and these were like who I hung out with, and we were the edgy kids. Uh-huh. And and mostly what I remember is is rebelling a little bit, and then I ended up going to, um, and then I ended up um, um, having a just basically having a good time. Uh, but but my memories are not all that academic from my time there. <laughs> <laughs> Neither were mine. So so tell me about this play that you've written. Um, too heavy for your pockets. Yeah. Give us the, a little bit of the synopsis, and I know that it's set in the civil rights during the civil rights movement, yeah. 1961. Mm-hmm. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about it. So, so too heavy for your pocket is about two couples living in Nashville in 1961. Um, I. Grew up going to the Civil Rights Museum once a year, and um, and I knew that I was like lived in a place that was historic. But it wasn't until I went to Yale that I realized that there was anything special about that. Um, that I just figured, you know, like I lived in somewhere historic. It's America. Everywhere is historic, and that's not true. That actually most places in America can't point to the seminal moment of like the Civil Rights. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. That's major. That only happened in Memphis, Tennessee. Tennessee. And it didn't click until then. I was like, wait, my grandparents were around for that. Where are your pictures with Martin Luther King? You know, like I was, yeah. I, I, it didn't, it didn't strike me as odd until people asked these kinds of questions, I yeah. think. And so I spent a uh, summer kind of just asking the questions, what were you doing, grandmother, in 1961? That's so funny you say that, because I remember the very moment when I was watching something about, you know, Woodstock and civil rights, and, and it dawned on me that my parents were alive then. And right. I said to them, so what were you guys doing during uh-huh. all this? And they said, we were working too hard to do anything. And that's the answer. <laughs> no, but it's in this... <laughs> I think we have uh, in our collective imaginations about the civil rights movement, even people who are around for it, that it was this thing that happened over there and on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, there were regular people around who decided, oh, over there is right here, and I'm going to go up to that pedestal. And so it's about um, this country boy who is the first in his entire family to go to college. He gets this scholarship to Fisk University and forfeits it in order to join the Freedom Rides of 1961. And his folks are really mad at him. His folks are like, you are throwing away this opportunity uh, to, to better your family, better your finances. None of us are smart enough to get into school and you've got a scholarship and you're going to throw it away. Your wife is working juke joints and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a handyman, you know, like people, what, what actually was the conversation? Um, and for me, I think the question that I posed or I was, or was interested in answering was, um, that the character in my play, Bozy Brandon, makes a decision to join the movement where the other three characters kind of make a decision not to, and is there value in the decision not to, in working hard and raising a family? Um, And it it was also kind of maybe my way to make myself feel better about um, being at Yale University in this kind of ivory tower while the Black Lives Matter protests were going around. And, you know, I was seeing people being killed on Facebook like everybody else, but I'm in school. Is there... Is there value in me being in school? Or should be I be out in the streets? And what is the difference between our own kind of personal relationship to the movements that are happening around us while we're alive today? Right, that's fascinating. And so you wrote this, because this has already been off-Broadway in New York, right. and, and you've won lots of awards for it. And yeah. so it was a few years ago. I mean, ever since this came out, it's just like constant protest <laughs> everywhere. You it's know? true, and about bigger and bigger things, I think. And that's what's, so, that's what's been so wild about um, 
I think my unique placement in in time in America is that my first time being able to vote was for Obama. I remember casting my vote for o- Obama's first election and feeling like I'm a part of something, even though obviously, you know, it's not like I campaigned, um, but feeling a part of the hope <laughs> sure. and the change and all of that. Um, and then kind of fast forward to 2015, which is, is in my opinion, kind of when the, the public... Um, find, found out about the amount of violence that was happening in these poor communities. Then fast forward to um, a pretty like contentious election, and then fast forward to today where there's a whole bunch to be upset about in a lot of different avenues. Um, whether um, you know whether it's about school shootings or still about Black Lives Matter, or you don't you're not fond of a wall, or you know whatever these things might be. There's just a heightened sense of political awareness, I think. And the question still is so relevant is, where do you fit in? You know, is it important to raise your family right now and make sure that your your tribe is taken care of? Is it important to sacrifice those things and join a fight, join a movement? Is it important, you know, where exactly do you want to locate yourself? And so it's been fun that I wrote this play in a really specific context Mm -hmm. and to see it you know, two years later at this point after it premieres to be in dialogue in different places in different contexts. It's, it's still super relevant. You know, my daughter texted me not too long ago and said, can you stop and get some poster board? I have to make some protest signs. Wow. You know? so I thought that's really wow, funny. You know? man. It's been a long time. But also time, good for you her. Know? You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I raised two very activist daughters, so nice. that's good. Um, there's a lot of parents out there of Snowden kids thinking right now, gosh, how do I get my kid to be that successful? <laughs> so take me on the path. What, what happened after, after you left um, Snowden and Memphis and, and what happened between then and now? Um, so I have to say that I um, uh, ended up going to Central High and kind of like a proud product of Bridge Builders and Memphis Prep, which now has a new name, but started off Memphis Prep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went to Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church. Awesome. And, and these, all of these programs intertwined, you know, it takes a village, um, really saw something special in me, I think, and wanted to make sure that I was someone who had the opportunities that I needed in order to move forward. And, um, and so by the time I graduated from high school, I was pretty snooty and <laughs> wanted to go to Carleton College, which yeah. is in, uh, in, in Minnesota, and, uh, and ended up going, you know, applying to various schools and had two similar packages in front of me. Did your mom say, Minnesota? Uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and just wanted to make sure I knew what snow was, because I yeah. didn't. Um, and then I had a package from Morehouse College and kind of made a uh, set that really long and hard with, do I go to this place that's been my dream or do I go to this place that I really feel like I'm being pulled towards? Uh, and went to Morehouse College in Atlanta. And um, and I think- Which was a good choice. I think it's still so. the South. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, 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 you know, in a city that is more geared towards the kind of uh, citizen that I want to be, I think. Um, I had some friends who went, up, went to Carleton and and did some really cool things, but I don't know, the, the sense of responsibility to one's community is something that I'm happy that I have, and I think really came from growing up in Memphis and going to the Civil Rights Museum and kind of understanding that this is a given, is that you participate, and then going to... Um, uh, the AUC, which is also this kind of cultural hub that is deeply invested in making sure citizens are participating and et cetera, et cetera. And so um, anyway, a long winded way of saying I went to Morehouse uh, and, uh, and discover theater and my passion for that there. And so were you, were you immediately going to be a writer or were you ever, you know, thinking about acting or you just loved oh, writing? I always, I always knew I wanted to be a writer from, be a writer. from very, very early on. And it wasn't until I got to college that I realized that plays were things that were written by people who were alive. Like, I think that they were like <laughs> some kind of I don't know. I, I don't know who I thought wrote plays, but I did right. not realize it was something I could do <laughs> um, until I um, until I watched um, a T- Terrell Ava McCraney who wrote Moonlight, mm-hmm. the the uh, the film. He has a series of plays called the Brother Sister Plays, which are putting kind of these African myths on stage, but in the projects of Florida, and it's this weird thing of like these these African gods are like cussing each other out in the projects of Florida. And I was like, wait, wait, this doesn't seem like anything I've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. 
I could write one of these. <laughs> and then I discovered, yeah, I could. And I really, really liked it um, and decided to throw all of my effort into it. And I'm really glad that it's paying off Yeah, because it was uh, a big gamble. I mean, yeah, you're, I mean, I'm, I am talking to you still at the beginning of your, what is going to be a very illustrious career. <laughs> I have no doubt. So I'm glad we've got you now while you're young. Um, you, we, we just have to get you to Discovery Park of America. Um, I know that you have a family connection there. Mm-hmm. Carly's your stepsister and she's a very talented graphic designer an artist who um, who works at Discovery Park of America. She's so, the best. Yeah, she's she, the best. And she's also an outdoors woman mm-hmm. and motorcycle rider now. So, um, yeah, following her on Facebook, you see all kinds of uh, interesting things. So, yeah. um, so you have to come visit her and hang out with us there sometimes. So how did you end up at Yale? It's a jump from um, the South. You finally left I the were, South and I went to Yale. finally saw some snow. Yeah. Um, it was... Um, it was a little bit of a, a happy accident, I guess. Um, when I, so, so I knew I wanted to be a playwright and I kind of graduated with that in mind. And it was, it was not really something I knew a direct path towards other than grad school and just writing plays, which I was doing at that point. And so luckily I had a mentor at the Alliance Theater uh, named Salisa Kalki who said, you know, after you graduate, intern here, and I promise we'll get you into an Ivy League college. Wow. Big, big promise. Yes. And I was, and I believed her, and she tells the story later on that she realized, what did I just say to him? (laughs) Um, (laughs) And uh, and I spent a year, and I, I, after I graduated college, working at the Alliance, and I would wake up early, and I would teach swimming in classes, and then after after uh, I would do my interning day, I would wait tables at this bowling alley called 300. <laughs> and, and I was just piecing it together. And, yeah. I, and it was my first kind of swing at adulting. And by the end of it, it was like, I better get into a school. And, uh, and turns out I got into Brown and Yale's programs. And it was a pretty exciting position to be in to decide if I wanted to go to, to Brown, which is a more kind of... Um, choose your own adventure kind of uh-huh. program for playwriting mm-hmm. or Yale, which is very much your first year, here are your classes, your second year, here are your classes, and in your third year, here are your classes, mm-hmm. and you will, you know, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I decided to go to Yale. I figured I really wanted that stringent education and uh, and, and I'm still paying for it uh, <laughs> emotionally. <laughs> it <laughs> but was I'm hard. glad I, I bet, did yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so you are, glad, you are glad you did it. It was a good... It was it's exhausting. It's, it's funny, uh, my, uh, a really good friend of mine just got cast in a play back there, and I'm going to go visit her for the very first time since I graduated in 2016, and I'm still like, all right, let me take a deep breath before I go back <laughs> there. That was a rough place to be, yeah. but I learned a lot. That's yeah. how we grow, right? Yeah, I think so, or at least I hope so. So were you, were you thinking about um, your play, um, Too Heavy for Your Pockets, yet at this point? Had you started working on it? Um, I think what, what happened was I discovered interviews, okay. um, that I discovered that a big part of my process is finding someone who I find interesting and having a conversation with them. Um, and while I was at Yale, I did a interview based project about, uh, Southern black men. And I interviewed six Southern black men of different generations and wrote a piece called 5013. And then I did some other interview based things. And then I think when I got to the t- end of my time at Yale, I wanted to write something that um, my grandmother could come see. And that was kind of the big point. Um, my plays are kind of, you mentioned wild visual metaphors that oftentimes they're a little lofty. And, I, and, and the biggest compliment up until then uh, was one time my mom um, uh, came after a play and was like, oh, Jure, I really like this one. I understood most of it this time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I want to write something that they'll just really be able to embrace without, and then I think, oh, maybe I'll write something about them. And yeah. so this play is about my grandmother, and I decided to interview her and, and spend time just digging into her life. Well, the New York Times wrote about this, that it was uh, felt as familiar and earnest as a pew. You know, oh, so nice. that was, that was uh, I thought that was very uh, eloquently written in the New York Times. Um, but the, the guy also said... Um, he found the play illuminating and moving. Oh, well, that was nice. To that's have, really sweet. Have, have a New York Times uh, <laughs> review like Jesse Green, yeah. who said that. So, um, 
You interviewed your grandmother, mm-hmm. and um, she uh, sort of threw off a comment about uh, the Freedom Riders, <laughs> yeah. and that sparked something in you. Mm-hmm. Share that with us. It was so funny. We were we were watching the Butler. It must have been the Butler, <laughs> um, and uh, and I was shocked because in the scene in the Butler, they do do the Mother's Day bus scene where these the the very first Freedom Ride, and um, they're attacked by. Um, these counter protest who, pro- protesters who try to blow up the, the the Greyhound that they're in, who who don't try to, who do blow up the Greyhound right. that they're in, and thank God all the people escaped with their lives. But I was like, I'm sure somebody died, right? And then my grandma was like, I don't think so. And I don't think I don't think Ernest did. And I was like, who's Ernest? He was like, you know, I wanted, I knew one of those Freedom Riders. He threw his education away to hop on a bus and just and just like kind of flip it, you know, like. I can't believe Ernest did that crazy thing back then. And then I thought to myself, you know, Freedom Rider, you know, like leading with the excitement, leading with the reverence that I think we have with the benefit of hindsight. But her at the time, she was pregnant with her third child. Her third child at the time was married and, you know, had was tending her own garden away. Right, that, right. That it looked so different that this, this kid is like, he has a chance to add an education, but he's going to throw it away to hop on a bus. And there is just so much dissonance between how I recollect that moment in history and how she recollected it, even as we were watching a movie about it. Yeah, and so in a minute, I'm going to ask you um, about what you think about it now, but um, let's talk a little bit more about um, the Freedom Riders uh-huh. and the research that you did yeah. and what surprised you about what you, what you discovered as you were researching and what was your process that you went through? Um, so, so the process was twofold. Um, I always try to do enough research that I know what questions to ask when I do these kind of research projects. So I had done a lot of research on the Freedom Riders and made sure I kind of understood the general landscape of the, um, the, um, the historical event. And I kind of was just planning on going to Nashville and getting some personal stories to pepper in. Um, but actually my uncle, um, Carl Holder, he knew some former Freedom Riders who were still in Nashville. Did you get to talk to John Lewis at all? I, d- I did not get to talk to John oh, Lewis, even one. though he was my congressman at the yeah. time. Um, <laughs> he, he, he has an incredible he's a busy story. Fella. Yeah. Um, but, but I talked to people who were still living in Nashville and mm-hmm. who were still giving field trip tours, historical tours of Nashville. You can get one to this day. And, and what they did was took me around the city to various places, downtown or Fisk or wherever, and told us um, about what this location meant in their journey. And so here we were uh, 50, almost 60 years later at this point, um, and they had been forever changed by this moment in history. And they talked about it with such um, a twinkle in their eye, that, 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 that this summer had changed their lives fundamentally. And the man who I spoke with the most, his name was Ma- Matthew Walker Jr. And he, had been the, he was the son of a prominent doctor in, uh, in Nashville, um, African-American. And he told me about um, the, the excitement and fear of every single moment. And so these things I had read about and seen in the documentaries and all of the things, I was now talking to a person who was recollecting them in front of right. me. And so when he told me about, um, uh, the boxes that African Americans had to use if they needed to use the bathroom downtown. He was remembering it, and that had such a different texture than I might read about. And in fact, that I, I I jumped the question that the most surprising thing was not how they were treated in prison, was not the songs that they sang, was not kind of any of the information that I had kind of known growing up or read about but the details that didn't make it into our history books. And for me, that's kind of what a play gets to do is I can present you with the facts, but I can, I can give you more of a feeling if I tell you a story. And, um, and on, if, if you were downtown and a person of color and you happen to be shopping in you know, the section that you were allowed to shop in or eating at the section that you were allowed to eat in, 
even with these kind of what I like to call slight injustices, right? I'm still allowed to shop there. I just have to do it differently. I don't have all the rights there. Or I'm still allowed to eat here, but I don't have all the rights. These slight injustices, those are well documented, but I think some of the ones that people just kind of took uh, as givens, right, were not. And so he mentions these boxes. And I was like, well, what boxes are you talking about? And he's like, no, no, no. If you had to go to the bathroom, you went down the, down the block, turned to right went to this alley, and there was a box for you. And I was like, what kind of box? You know, I still can't even picture <laughs> right. what you're talking about. Right. And he's like, it's a cardboard box. What are you talking about? You cardboard box, and you go to the bathroom, and that's where you pee. Right. Or you hold it, you know. Right. And one of the most moving monologues for me in the play is when the when um, uh, Bozy's good friend Sally is talking about a recent trip to those boxes, and so she goes downtown and she shops and she she notices all the slight injustices, but thanks to Bozy's ride, she notices a more perverse one, which is the just standard of living. Right, as a human being, I have to go to the bathroom as a human being, and I'm being denied the right to do that in the privacy of a, a door that closes just because I'm black. And those kind of things, I think, to this day, we don't really think about. Um, you, you are welcome to edit this out if it's too political, but I think, I immediately think about transgendered people in their bathrooms and this sense of, um, this that that we have had the privilege as you know cis people not to think about it you know that sees says a man I'll go in the man's bathroom and see a girl go in the girl's bathroom and then the moment it is even brought up oh there might be some other option that you're so used to it that it doesn't even strike you as an injustice in the same way and I think that the ability to talk about um the nuances to these kinds of injustices and how deep they go and to what levels and what degree are you depriving someone of their personhood? What degree are you depriving someone of citizenship? And then I think in all the macro senses, to what degree are you just like allowed to have the right to prosper, the right to the same American dream as everybody else? And so what, is, what do you see as the role of storytelling in communicating those ideas in a way that might be more comfortable for some people to hear and to understand and to process? I think everybody's brains are wired really differently. Some people have more mathematical brains. Some people have more literary brains. Some people see in colors. Some people see in feelings. So everybody has a different way that they come about things, which is why we have different specialties, right? You can notice really early if someone's really good in math but very poor in English as far as like growing up. I think we're all wired to understand stories. In fact, that's all we're doing any day, given moment of any given day is regurgitating a story telling you what happened on my way to the grocery store, or letting you know how my day went, or telling you about this thing that happened when I was a kid, or, um, or even, you know, we're just like constantly telling ourselves story after story after story. And so I might lecture to people about the injustices that gay people incur, or I might discuss to you why I think it is a better economic plan for America blank. Um, but those aren't stories, really, those are facts. Those are facts and figures and, and, and points of view and all these kind of things. But when I just tell you, once upon a time, there was a little boy, and that little boy grew up to be blank. All of a sudden, our, we're triggered in a really different way. And I, and I find it a real honor to be able to tell stories. And I think that that's why I love interviews is I'm not making up stories either. I'm telling your story. I'm telling your story. I am making sure that your experiences communicate to the world. And because it's in the form of a story, for the most part, someone's going to get something out of it. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's so fascinating. Um, I could sit here all day talking to you. Well, I appreciate you letting me go on my little rant. Oh my gosh, no, my you kidding? It's incredible. And for the record, we cut nothing out, right, Luke? We cut, oh. nothing, we cut nothing out of our podcast here at Real Foot Forward. Um, is your play going to be produced anywhere coming up anytime soon? Yeah. After it leaves Hattie Lou? Oh, I'm, it is 
Yes, is the answer to the question. It's a real honor. Um, so Hadalu, it'll be there until April 14th uh, in Memphis, which I'm thrilled about. Um, there will be an opportunity to see it in Chicago if anyone happens to be in Chicago at the Timeline Theater. Um, St. George Playhouse is doing it in uh, New Jersey. And then uh, a theater company that I helped fund, uh, found in Iowa is going to be doing it next summer. Oh, my and gosh. So, there's so that's one, two, three coming up. Yeah. But it, then it was just in LA and in Dallas and in Houston. Now you need three <laughs> or four more also rotating around like that. What is the next play? Are you, are, I know we're gonna we're gonna talk about the TV show in just uh-huh. a minute. But okay. <laughs> any more plays cooking? I have I have a play coming to the Roundabout Theater off Broadway in May 2020. Oh my gosh! So I am really really excited about that. You are what they call in the business a hot property right now. So <laughs> so let's let's talk about. Uh, uh, let's talk about television because okay. not everybody's going to get to go to, go exactly. to the theater. Mm-hmm. Some people like to watch their their stories on on TV. Mm-hmm. So all this talk about theater and all the success now, all of a sudden, you're <laughs> writing for a hit show on NBC called New Amsterdam. It's true. So yeah. how did that come about? <laughs> it was the most random thing on the planet. <laughs> um, you know, when I, when I was in grad school, I kind of went into a hole and I did not watch any television. And and so I really thought that TV had kind of like peaked at Grey's Anatomy and I and, I, and then I resurfaced and all of a sudden there was like Breaking Bad and Scandal and mm-hmm. um, and Game of Thrones. And I thought to myself, wow, these are <laughs> these are some incredible stories being told. Um on, with a really different medium, and, and television is just so, so, so different than a play with a distinct mi- beginning, middle, and end, versus TV, you're just like hanging out with the same five people for years. Um, and uh, and David Schulner had created this amazing show based upon uh, the real life story of um, a medical director who had cancer while he was trying to turn this public hospital around, and was inspired by that. And I thought, wow, that seems like something I could right if I knew anything about medicine, and I didn't. And so I just applied for it just, you know, for the heck of it and, and, and to, to practice talking about television because it wasn't something that I was all that well versed in. And uh, thank goodness David Schoner used to be a playwright and, and shifted to television at the same age that I am, saw something in me and gave me a job. It's incredible. <laughs> and you're, the episode that you actually wrote just uh-huh. aired uh, on January 15th. It did. So um, what was that like? Uh, to sit, and, were you with your family or your friends? And when yeah. you watched it, like from your living room, <laughs> you watched the whole thing. Like, you, were you able to mouth the words? Because <laughs> it was. I mean, the the thing that's so special is I know every single person who has come to see a play that I've had something to do with. You know, I I would that you have to be in driving distance of the city to go see that play, and the likelihood of me being there is high. Versus. Two million people right, <laughs> are right. watching, you know, the episode that you wrote on television. And I now, you know, I visit my mom's friends uh, at work and they're like, oh, my God, I love New Amsterdam. And I might have never met this person. And now they are exposed to a story that I told. It's incredible. Right. It's um, really incredible. It really is. Thank you so much for sharing just a little bit with us today. I know everybody listening is going to be running to jarebrionholder.com. Yeah. Or if they can't spell that, they're going to Google. Mm-hmm. Of, of those three, they'll get the spelling on one of them, right? So your website will, <laughs> your website will pull up. Um, and they can follow along. Your Instagram is great. They'll be able to follow you uh, and your future success. You have a lot, a lot going on. And we have a lot to look forward to at Discovery Park of America. America, seeing one of our family members succeed. Thanks so much. This is awesome. Thank you. It's been fun. I don't think he's written a play yet, but if he ever does, Discovery Park of America has given Andrew Gibson a lot to write about. Here he is to share yet another fascinating discovery. Hey, thank you, Scott. Here today on the Real Foot Forward podcast, we have a very special guest um, that's going to be teaching us about fossils here in West Tennessee. Um, it is Nate, one of our docents here at Discovery Park of America. Nate, how are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you, Andrew? I'm doing fantastic and even more excited and fantastic now that I get to learn more about fossils. Uh, in a previous episode, um, you've gotten to hear about uh, Coon Creek um, and uh, the abundance of fossils there and a word that I'm not going to try to pronounce because it's so long. What was that word again, Nate? 
up referring to Coon Creek. Yeah. The Lagerstätte Konservaten. Yeah, that. Um, yeah, <laughs> that is what we talked about last time. But on this episode, we're going to be talking about um, what I believe is before Coon Creek. Is that correct? Is that right. what I, we kind of briefed the, the quick briefing on this? Right. And so, so Coon Creek was about 71 million years ago. And what we're going to be talking about today was about uh, 450 to 380 million years ago. Okay. So that's uh, what, what would you call that period? So from well, up until uh, 444 from 450, it would be uh, the Ordovician period. Then from 444 to 419 million years ago would be the Silurian period. And then 419 to 369 million years ago would be the Devonian period, which is when most of these rocks originate from okay devonian and silurian so other you know other than the the name and time period what is what distinguishes those most of how we name geologic periods is based on sea level and the kind of life that is most abundant in the, at those times so the silurian is called the age of plants because that's when plants started to kind of evolve and come onto land uh the devonian is the age of fishes that's when fish were started to become a lot more abundant and we start to find a lot more fish fossils in the Devonian. So, and that's, that's the Devonian. That's the one we're talking about today, correct? Mostly Silurian. That's what mostly Silurian. That's okay. what my work is in. Oh, okay. And, uh, um, how much time have you invested into this? Uh, just a few years. Just, just, <laughs> just a few years. Uh, all right. So I'm, I am ready to be enlightened. So where do you think we should begin with this? Well, we can talk about, uh, how they were found. Okay. Pretty much. So when you look at most of West Tennessee, it, it's all pretty flat. You don't really have much rock outcropping at all. Then you look along the Tennessee River and you have these huge cliffs of beautiful rock. And a lot of people wonder why. Well, that's a long story. That's a st story for another time. But uh, a paleontologist that was coming through in 1848 on his way to Texas saw that same setup. And he saw that uh, there was nothing, and then suddenly a lot. And so he started looking into uh, the rocks right along the Tennessee River, and he started finding fossils that had never been described before. Uh, his name was Ferdinand Romer. He was a paleontologist from uh, Breslau, Germany, that was on his way to Texas to uh, describe some rocks that had never been described before. And uh, while passing through, he ended up describing over 40 new species from the rocks right along the Tennessee River. So when you're saying species, what do you what do you mean by species? So a lot of them were coral and sponges, uh, some mollusks. The one that is most important and the one that my work is in, I'm not just saying it's the most important because that's what my work uh, is in. Yeah, I understand that. But yeah. it counts. Um, is a sponge called Astriospongia meniscus. Did you pick it because of the name? No. No. Did you draw it out of a hat? Is that how that works? No. Like when you're when you're when you're in school for this, or like you're going to be studying hmm, this long word. <laughs> no, my uh, professor actually chose it for me. Okay. Well, he had a project and he needed someone to look into it, and I was ready and willing to do so. Okay. All right. So so continue on about the astral sponge. <laughs> Astrio spongia, so astrio because uh, the little spicules on the bottom are shaped like stars. They're like little uh, snowflakes. And spongia because it's a sponge. And meniscus because it's shaped kind of like a short bowl, mm -hmm. almost like a dinner plate really because it's so shallow and yet so wide. And that's what makes it so unique in the sponge world really. When you look at most sea sponges, they're much taller and kind of tube-like, whereas this one is so close to the ground and yet so wide it's about two inches across a lot of the mature individuals are and maybe a quarter inch maybe even just an eighth of an inch high off the sea floor so it really does just look like a dinner plate sitting on the sea floor any fossil sponge collection in the world is going to have a specimen of astriospongy meniscus if it's any sponge collection at all really and it most likely originates from either decatur or perry county tennessee so those are the central locations for that sponge, and that's where it was described from. So, how rare is this sponge? Like, is it like is there an abundance of it, and you're you're finding it in, in these places all across uh, Tennessee, or is it you know is is it one of those rare finds? It's not very rare at all around there. So if you go to uh, 
if you walk along the beach around Mouse Tail Landing State Park, which is in Perry County, a lot of the beaches are composed primarily of fossil sponges. And of course, normal people walking along that don't care or don't know wouldn't realize that. But if you pick it up and look very closely, you can see the little star shapes on the bottom of a lot of these rocks that are perfectly round. And you may be wondering, how is it so perfectly round? Because it's a fossil, it's a sponge. So can anyone just go out and pick fossils and take them home with them? Or are there any uh, regulations that go along with it? Well, you can't do that from a state park. Okay. But uh, if you have friends that may have private property along the river or along uh, you know, the cliffs along the river, then by all means, you can collect. So um, for, for someone who has that, that friend that has property along those lines, um, are there any kind of kind of tips you could recommend to our listeners? Like if they want to go out fossil hunting, um, anything they would, you know, which you would recommend for them to look for? So, like I said, it looks like a short bowl uh, the, uh, with a lot of little stars on it. And really my only tip can be don't hit it too hard. You will break it. <laughs> so it's just as soft as the rock around it. Okay. So my work specifically is, was in trying to figure out why it was so short like I said, most sponges, they're a lot taller. They look more tube-like, whereas this one was just so flat. And another thing, it was preserved in mud, which most fossils are not. They're preserved in much larger grains of sand just because you know, with a, when a sponge is in mud, the holes in the side that it basically breathes and eats through are going to get clogged. And that's the mystery I was trying to solve. And... Now I'm curious. <laughs> did you solve the mystery? I think so. What's 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 your hypothesis on it then? So when you look at hexactinellid sponges, which is the group of sponges that this comes from, which basically just means that the little stars have six points coming off. Um, you look at the how sea level has changed through time, and you look at how these sponges have changed through time. It correlates when sea level is higher. These sponges are shorter, and when sea level is lower, these sponges are much taller. And I was wondering, how could th why? Why would that be? And I believe the answer is, when sea level rises, it's going to overtake a lot of low-lying areas, and you're going to end up having a lot of shallow sea, basically. So, like I talked about with Coon Creek before, when sea is shallow, storms can kick up the sediment on the bottom. And basically clog the pores of the sponge. Um, so what the short sponges in higher sea level did was basically just survive on the seafloor under where the sediment is being shot across. Okay, I got it. So Nate, thank you. I don't you. know if that answers the question. I think, I, I, I mean, <laughs> it, it gives me, you know, I... I Definitely didn't have any idea of these sort of things here in here in Tennessee, or let alone um, astral sponges, or you know the the fancy name you you said earlier. Um, what was the name one more time, just so that way I can the the sponge that you oh, were Astriospongia meniscus. Ast no, right, we're gonna we're gonna work on this together. <laughs> All right, ready? So Astrio Astrio sponges Spongia Spongia meniscus meniscus Astrio Spongia meniscus Astrio spongica meniscus close <laughs> close i feel like i'm in harry potter like casting you know like, right. like, it's levio <laughs> like that's exactly how i feel nate all right guys well thank you so much for listening uh once again my name is andrew gibson i'm here with nate newland and uh, we appreciate you guys stopping by listening find out more here at discovery park of america where we have um, examples of these sponges and other types here on display here we hope to see you here soon goodbye Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.